You just had a chance to talk to Jim Roselli about uh, Robert Jackson. Yes. And maybe you could just kind of repeat what it is that you said about Justice Jackson, your reflection on that. Well, I was just saying to Jimmy that, that um, when, I think it was in, uh, in June that um, I guess General Donovan first uh, called us all together in his office and, and uh, told us something about the impending war crimes uh, trial. And then in my thinking about it, getting to know something more about what was just being planned. Uh, I was really impressed that uh, Justice Robert Jackson was, um, seemed to be the main force pushing for and, and a, uh, a legitimate trial that would base, based on uh, international law and that would not just, not just in a proper way <laughs> line these guys up and shoot them as the Russians wanted to do, but, but to really build something that would go beyond, the, um, beyond the, the impact of that immediate war and um, be a model for, model for future, future um, trials if, if they had to be. And uh, I think we are seeing the body of light now, uh, today more than ever, of, of, uh, of, uh, of what his vision was. That's what I feel. Last night you had a chance to take a look at the Robert Jackson Center for the very first time. I certainly did. I'm, I can't tell you how impressed I am by it. I think it's a wonderful job that you're doing. And I'd like to find a, a little time to just look at every, <laughs> everything you've got here. It's, it's a great job. I don't think we'll have a problem getting you back uh -huh. <laughs> Thanks. We had a chance to talk about on the waterfront last night, but you're a man of so many... The ultimate renaissance man, Bud Schulberg. And I thought I'd just throw out some names at you of people whose lives you passed and just give us an anecdote or two. And I'll start with F. Scott Fitzgerald. Well, F. But Scott, uh, I had just got, gotten out of the dark, trying to make it brief because it was, it was a long story that finally filled a fairly long book. but. Uh, I, it's okay. I had just gotten out of college up at Dartmouth and, uh, about three years before, and I, I was back as a young screenwriter. And Walter Wenger, the producer at the Samuel Goldwyn studio, had, had been my sponsor for Dartmouth. He had really sent me there, uh, helped to get me in. And uh, he, he called me in and gave me a job. Uh, writing a movie about the winter, about the winter, winter carnival, and so I did. I wrote four, forty pages or so, and uh, and Walter didn't like it very much, and uh, he said that he was going to uh, put another writer on it, and uh, I didn't like that idea so much. Writers never do, but I said, who? Uh, who was the other writer? And uh, he said, it's, um, it's Scott Fitzgerald. And uh, I truly thought that he was just pulling my leg. For one thing, I thought somehow I got the impression that Scott had died. And so I did. I just said, Scott Fitzgerald, you're kidding me, Walter. Scott Fitzgerald is dead, isn't, isn't he? And he said, not at all. He's right in the next room reading his script. So I went in, and, and Scott was just finishing the last page. <coughs> and that's how I met him. And uh, he, he looked up at me, and he said, well, uh, we, he said, I don't think it's very good. And I said, I said, Mr. Fitzgerald, I don't think it's very good either. And, and, we, was, and we started to work together. And it's sort of a long story, we went out for lunch, and of course, I, I was fascinated with him. And uh, I said, my God, I never thought I'd be at a, at a, at a table having lunch with, with Scott Fitzgerald. And, and he said, well, I'm amazed that you even know 
I'm surprised that you know who I am. And I said, my God, we, we, I read all your books, all your books in college. I started right about the, the ten was an item. Still one of my very favorite books. I have it on my desk. I, I just, sometimes I just open it and start reading it. Marvels. And uh, he was, he told me that, that day that, that, um, that uh, all his books were, were out of print. And he asked me, how much do you think my royalties were last year? And I said, uh, I thought it must be low, so I said, I don't know, $500. And he said, last year, my royalties were $13.80. And that's how, that's how we started. We, got, we went off on this weekend that was a, a disaster, absolutely a disaster. I, I can't go into all the details, but we, we both sort of fell apart. Scott, Scott got very drunk. It was sort of my fault. Uh, my, father brought, my father was uh, very literary. And uh, he, he was excited about Fitzgerald, even though, even though the town was pretty much turning their back on him. And Winger was giving him kind of, kind of like a, a last uh, chance. But my father brought two big bottles, those magnum bottles of mum's champagne to the plane. It was a trip that Scott did not want to take. He argued against it. The wind was taking us up to the Winter Carnival. And in the meantime, we, nightmare situation, he was sending his photographic unit up there and uh, uh, planning to shoot all the locations of our story, which we didn't have. We just couldn't, we could not lick this damn thing. It was a very mechanical, and anyway, I don't know, it, it really didn't grab either one of us very much. And uh, we, we started drinking that champagne on, uh, on, the, uh, on the trip. Uh, young people have no idea what flying to New York was like in those days. There were sleepers like a Pullman on a train because it went on 16, 17 hours. We, we, would, we would stop and refuel twice, I think. And uh, it was just um, endless. Uh, we, drank the, we drank the whole first bottle of champagne on, on, the, on the first leg of the trip, I think. And we got along so well because we had so many interests in, in um, common. I, I was, of course, fascinated by his knowing Ernest Hemingway and Das Passos, all the great writers of the 20s. And he was quite interested in, in the in new people, that writers of the 30s that, um, that I knew. And um, we were both, both very anti-Nazi. Anti he was much more political than people realized. Really, a liberal in in, uh, in, uh, in politics. We were both sports sports fans, interested in football. I don't think we just got along very well. And the one we enjoyed talking about everything in this world, about Hollywood. He was very interested in my having been raised in Hollywood, and we got along great on everything. So we couldn't get this damn movie together, and. I won't go into it all, but we, he uh, unraveled, and we, sit, we stayed at the New Western uh, uh, Hotel. <clears throat> no, no at, at, at the Warwick Hotel. Every time I go by, I still look up at the, at the 10th floor, little sort of a, a fake balcony. I still look up at that uh, up at that room where we went through went through hell, and. Um, he did get drunker. Uh, he found well, it's it's too it's almost too long to tell, <laughs> Greg. But you ultimately ended up with his social security card. Hmm? You ended up with F. Scott Fitzgerald's social security card. Yes, I did. Yes, How I did. That In some crazy way, we got off it on the train. Another nightmare because um, Wenger was. Wenger was pushing us. 
when you get off this plane, uh, the uh, camera crew director will be waiting for you, and you've got to give them set your uh, your um, setup of uh, of the uh, story backgrounds, which we still did not have, and um, we stood up and talked about it. And, and Scott was pretty far gone. We got off at Springfield, Massachusetts, and the train stopped there. And we saw a little coffee place in the train station. We got the idea that we'd get off and grab a quick coffee that might help us. And we did. And, and, and at the counter, Scott stumbled and almost to his knees, and, and these things fell, fell out of his pocket, including his uh, check for 1500 bucks, and uh, I know I, I just put things b back as best I could, and uh, as we're hurrying back to the train, the train, train pulled out without us, but uh, somehow I must have that day picked up his uh, social security card when he fell, had it in my pocket, somehow that got put away, in some box, and years and years and years later, looking for something else, I found it. And by that time, I decided, I, I guess I'll keep it. Very simple here. Switching gears here, in Paris of 1947, you're at a party, and there's a guy named Ernest Hemingway there, and you start talking about boxing. How, what happened there? Well, but it was... Um, in fact, the first time I met um, first time I met Hemingway, it, it was in the Key West. I I didn't know I I did meet him at the at the Scrib Scrib Hotel in in uh, in Paris uh, 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 during the war, and uh, there was just saying hello. But my trouble with him was in um, Key West. Uh, 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 abuse, Mutual friend of, of ours, Toby Bruce, sort of his secretary, Man Friday, and a very good friend of mine was giving a party for, for Ernest. And, uh, and I was out in a little patio having a drink there. First, and he was in shorts, not shorts exactly, it, it looked like blue jeans that had been ripped apart. They were wearing the upper part of it. And, and he came staggering toward me, and, and, and he sort of poked me. He was very, not very nice. He said, you're Schulberg? And I said, yeah, yes. And, and he, said, uh, he said, you're the book writer? And I didn't like it. And he said, uh, yeah, I've written a few books. And next thing he said was, well, what the hell, what the hell do you know about boxing, for Christ's sweet sake? And um, he ran me down a... He ran me down a list of famous fighters, one after another, famous middleweights. And, and at, at the beginning, I, I answered him as, as quietly as I could. Yes, he was a great middleweight from Philadelphia, this, that. And each time I answered one, he would poke me, not exactly punch me, but shove me very hard on the shoulder. And I, I'd have to take a step back. And, and uh, after about... After about um, five of these names thrown at me, he, he said, uh, Pinky Mitchell, that's what he'd do. He'd just name a name, Pinky Mitchell, and he shoved me. And I took a deep breath and I said, well, Pinky Mitchell was, you know, junior worldwide champion of the world and he, the um, brother of Richie Mitchell who had a great fight with Manny Leonard and and he came out to fight our fighter. We thought of him like that, Moshe Callahan, who, in spite of his name, was a local Jewish uh, heavyweight, of uh, 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 World White, Morris uh, Shear. And I said, in that fight, uh, Moshe won and uh, won the title. And he was a friend of our family. And Moshe gave me the gloves that he won with, and I had them on a wall over my bed. Instead of finally saying, well, I guess you, 
didn't know him and know something about boxing. He, he went right on. He, he pushed me harder and said, and barked at me. He said, he, he didn't react to that at all. He, he said, Pete Lasso. Just he yelled it at me like that and shoved me against the wall. He was an unbelievable bully. And, and so I, again, I tried to be patient. I said, you know, Pete, Pete Lasso. I, I said, Ernest, I don't think you realize this, but every one of these fighters is, is like a Hall of Fame fighter. These are all uh, Leo Lomsky. Or this, these are famous fighters. Yeah. And uh, I said, Pete Lasso beat Mickey Walker, you know, a famous fighter from Scranton, Pennsylvania, excellent fighter. And, um, and I said, after he retired, he went back to Scranton and is now an organizer for the Teamsters Union. And, and then I pushed him a little, not as hard as he pushed me, I pushed him a little bit. And I said, and if, you, if you're so interested in Pete Letzer, why don't you go up and see him? And he wheeled and walked away and went back in the house. And I was leaning against the wall, I totally remember it. I leaned against the wall, seething. I was so, God, you know, this, this great writer, this great man, behaving like an idiot, really. And, and uh, Toby was little, uh, Toby, he came back with a Bloody Mary for me. And, and he said, um, he said, Papa's in the kitchen. And, um, Papa says he likes you. And I said, I said, Toby, you go back and tell Papa that I admire him very much. But from now on, I plan to admire him from as far away as I can get from him. I did. I, I did. It, that was pretty much, the uh, Hemingway stories go on, but that, that's just one of many, many. So you and I have talked about it a little bit, um, I, and it's such a great story of how your Nuremberg past caught up with Lenny Riefenstahl. Here's the famous you know, um, yeah. film producer, and you had a, uh, an opportunity to be oh, well in that, Hollywood before you got to Nuremberg, you know, just to... Mm, mm. There's that picture of Lenny. And maybe you can recount the story of how, as a uh, young writer in Hollywood, uh, you were not a Lenny Riefenstahl fan, and then in 1945 or 46, you had a chance to sort of complete the circle in Nuremberg. Yep, yes. Well, oh, thanks. Well, we, uh, up, up in Berlin, where we were planning the year, Planning the films for the um, for the trial, um, we ran. Of course, we ran the triumph of the will. Let me read some powerful, scary, scary, powerful uh, propaganda, pro Hitler film, and uh, we thought that there might be ever so many uh, occasions to identify people. Uh, some military people, some like shocked and so forth, who, who were at the at the party congress, uh, nodding uh, assent when when Hitler was making dangerous threats against neighboring countries, all the rest of it, and uh, we thought the the um, tribunal was very very. Um, very tough on us, I guess rightly, in, in uh, wanting witnesses, uh, fearing that, that the uh, German uh, uh, council might be able to uh, throw photographic uh, evidence out, if not probably identified, all the rest of it. And um, so, we got the idea then that maybe we ought to find Lenny Riefenstahl. It was one of the main, main uh, film propagandists for, for uh, Hitler. She, she not only made Triumph of the Will, but, but, but other uh, smaller 
40 day, 40 day uh, uh, films and th through the Army counterintelligence and some OSS work, we found where she was living uh, outside of Munich somewhere on a lake. In, in kind of a touch of, anyway, we found her, and um, so I went down to I, just a weapons, open weapons carrier. Was, transportation was really tough all over. Everybody was scrounging around to get a jeep, and, and uh, I, just an army driver with me, and I went in to see her in my naval uniform, and, and uh, there she was, and very nice house, and she was very worried when I, when, when she saw me come in, and, um, but she then sat me down and said, you know, I was never a Nazi. This went in this whole song and dance. I was so familiar for so many Germans. Uh, and never a Nazi. I was a pure, simply a pure artist. It was just a subject that I, I was using in order to make a pure uh, a documentary art. And, and she said, when I, I'm very misunderstood because when I went to Hollywood in, in 1938, everybody there turned out and uh, they received me as a, as a film artist and not as a Nazi. And uh, she didn't know, of course, that I, that I, I came from Hollywood and uh, that um, I had been one of those in a small way that had helped to boycott the the uh, reception that Max Sennett was giving for her. Uh, out there we had arranged that every uh, invitee, like uh, Melvin Douglas and Dorothy Parker and many of the liberal, liberal anti-Nazi celebrities, Freddie March, uh, a whole bunch, each had a list of 10 people to call not to go. And so, so only, it was a, complete fiasco of a party, only the extreme right wing, you know, the, uh, the McLaughlin, and the, really the fastest minded people in Hollywood uh, turned up and she didn't, she didn't, of course, had no idea. I let her talk for a little while and then... Let me get this straight. She's telling you the story of what a success it was, little, not knowing that you're sitting there wearing an army uniform, yep, yep. navy uniform, and you had undermined this event, which occurred many years earlier. That's right. That is absolutely true. That's absolutely true. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and, and I didn't. I didn't. Um, I didn't tell her. I didn't say anything. I, did, I just said yes. I, I, I didn't. I wasn't going to get into any argument. With her. But I finally, after I heard her out, I finally this this. The warrant was burning a hole in my pocket, in my side pocket. I, I took out this warrant. I finally said, well, Ms. Riefenstahl, I'm, I'm very sorry, but, but uh, 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 I have a warrant. I have to take you to Nuremberg. Whereupon then she screamed. She suddenly screamed something like, pussy, pussy. They're, taking, they're arresting me. And, and a little man raced in. I don't know where the hell he came from. And she said, they're taking me away. She was, really uh, historical. I tried to explain to her that she was uh, not going there as a, as a war criminal or in, indicted war criminal, but s simply as a material witness and that she would have to come with me and stay and that she wouldn't be in jail. She'd be like in a hotel. There was kind of a, kind of a guest house that they had for the different um, witnesses. And so she came very reluctantly uh, in this open car, just the three of us, all the way to Nuremberg. Can you describe Lenny Riefenstahl to us? She was still, still really quite beautiful. And, and uh, uh, if you could forget her connections, really very, very charming. And I would think to many people very, uh, very convincing in her intensity about her art and the, her love of the mountains and, and winter sports. And she, um, she, she was really quite, a, quite an uh, imposing piece of work, I think. Did 
course, this didn't end at Nuremberg. You, in fact, were very much involved. Lenny Riefenstahl thought you were ahead of her anti-Lenny Riefenstahl society. Yes, she did. Yeah. But that went on for some a long time, I think. Yes, she did. Well, I wrote, I, I wrote a piece about her in, in the Saturday Evening Post that really ticked her off. It, it was called Nazi uh, Pinup Girl. <laughs> she didn't like that article very much, and uh, and I guess she did consider me the leader of the anti anti reformist party. Uh, yes, she, yes, she did, and she never. She never really, she never changed that tune. I mean, when she was 100 years old, she was still saying what she said when, she must have been around 40, I'm not sure the exact age. She looked about maybe 40, but a very good looking 40 when I saw her, but she never changed. Um, I've also been under attack at times, much to my annoyance, by um, feminists who began to make um, Lenny a, a heroine of, of the feminist uh, movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always thought that was, though she, there's no doubt that uh, she was a, a master at her craft, she was, but uh, I, I always thought that that, 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 that uh, connection with the Nazi movement. Oh, oh, hi Sandra, I didn't see you there before. <laughs> Uh, excuse me. Uh, I always thought that that should uh, should be a, a mark against her. That I mean, I could never forgive it myself, and and a lot of people could not forgive it. And and the fact that she was also a talented woman, and I thought in this case it ought to be uh, second uh, to the main main thrust of what her real contribution in in history was. You were in the military, you were in the Navy, you were assigned by Wild Bill Donovan, this is important for, that's the Donovan you referred to, which is a Buffalo connection. Oh, right, yeah. he came Bill. from Buffalo, didn't he? Yeah. And, and that's important. Uh, and here you were in a position in Nuremberg where you were trying to identify the various people in the film. Yes. Uh, but at the same time, you're seeing some pretty horrific images. Uh, to what extent, you being Jewish, did that affect kind of your intensity of uh, the, the art? Uh, obviously, the, the Nazis had pinpointed uh, a variety of folk, but particularly the Jewish. Did that have an extra layer of, of, of intensity for you when you were putting together the movie? Did you get a sense of that? Well, yes, I think so. I think so, Greg. I, I mean, the, uh, my, uh, my fear and loathing of the, uh, of the Nazis started very, very, very early, well, all the way back to when he, before he really even uh, took over and, uh, and seized uh, power. And I couldn't help but, sounds funny to say, but I couldn't help Identifying with the with the Jews, uh, I I had a funny up up upbringing. Up. I was um, I was expelled from um, B'nai B'rith from the sun, Sunday school when I was four years old. I was kicked out for something bad that I had done in the in the temple, and um, and so for. For some, for some years on, on the Jewish holidays, I would go to school uh, in, the, in the junior high school, and uh, the kids would say, but you, God, but I'm, I'm Jewish, why are you here? And I, I really, without being funny, I, I, I said, yeah, uh, uh, I, used to be, I used to be Jewish, but they kicked me out. <laughs> and... and, and um, it really took, I truly think, it sounds ridiculous, but it took uh, Adolf Hitler very early on, I guess by 1932 practically, when I was still a teen teenager, to realize that, that whether they 
whether whether Rabbi Magnin checked me out or not, um, that if I were in Germany, I'd be in heavy trouble. And and uh, so I, plus I uh, identified, and it did. I I think that it did uh, uh, in, intensify my feeling. Although I think truly my feeling would have been there anyway, seeing what he was doing to to the Czechs and it, to the other people he wanted to uh, oppress. Did your experience at Nuremberg affect, this is after you left Nuremberg, did it affect at all your, your writing style, your, your view towards your craft, which was being a, a writer? Is there any relationship there? I don't think it really, I'm afraid, I'm afraid it didn't really, Greg. I can't say that it did. It was a very, it was a very meaningful period in my life. But at the end of the war, it, instead of writing about it, which I probably should have written a novel about it, uh, I sort of reverted to the pre-war. I had been working on a novel about boxing that came out after the war called The Harder They, they Fall. And I'd really kind of started outlining that, written a little opening of it when I got into the, uh, the OSS, John Ford. And so what I did was, for a long time, put all that aside and go back to, I was sort of back where I was before I put on the uniform and uh, finished that. And so it, it didn't end that, in that way, it, it didn't as much as it maybe it should have affected my writing more. You've never really spent any time writing about that experience at Nuremberg, have you? No, it's strange that I haven't. I, I've often thought, I, I, I've asked myself, uh, why is it that I've waited, I've waited so long because I've thought about it so much over my lifetime, and if I get my uh, if I get my second volume of your memoirs in, uh, uh, it'll be there. Well, your first volume, your memoirs, ended when you were how old? I'm afraid it was ended when I was 18. Well, we have 72 years to go. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> my friends kid me about this because I say, Jesus, but if 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 you wrote 400 and some pages about up to the age of 18, what the hell is the rest of it? It's going to be 5,000 pages. Well, what a life. A few individuals who I uh, just need to talk about. Then maybe Sandra, do you have, uh, Sandra or uh, Jean? I'll let you jump in. Uh, Dorothy Parker. It says you socialized with Dorothy Parker. Oh, yeah. How did that go about? Oh, very, very much. Well, uh, after the war, no, I mean after college, after I got back from Dartmouth, I went to work for David Selznick, who announced he had his own, own company. David had been my father's assistant at, at Paramount. Just before I went to college, I... I wrote a story, a film story, uh, when I was about 18 that he bought and liked uh, about a little, uh, about a, a, um, a black kid whose mother is a cook for a movie star. And so he's thrown in with the movie star's son. Anyway, David liked it. And, uh, and I was working on that when I went off to college and he said, when you get back, uh, I'll have a job for you. So I was working. Uh, he asked Green Lodger Jr. and me to work on a movie, the uh, Hollywood movie, uh, A Star is Born, to write a screenplay. Uh, at the same time, typical, typical Hollywood. Uh, Bill Wellman, the director, and his writer, Robert Carson, were writing a screenplay. Dorothy Parker and her husband, Alan Campbell, were writing a screenplay, all on the same story. And what, uh, and what David 
plan to do, it goes against everything that I believe in film writing. What he planned to do was take the best scenes from each and make the, his final David Sullivan script. Crazy way. And that turned out, I think, one of the best of the, um, uh, of the three uh, Soros Bonds. I think it turned out amazingly well. It's, it's, and uh, in the course of that, we wrote a scene to send to David, and instead it went by accident to Dottie and, and uh, Alan. And when we heard that, we said, oh, Jesus, you know, they're going to eat us alive. Instead, she called, Dottie called us down and said, you boys, I'm, I've read this, and, and um, uh, uh, I really think it's better than our scene. I, I, we like it a lot. We're going to tell David. We're going to tell we got to be very, very good friends, and um, I'd um, go to the house every, I would say every, every weekend for uh, uh, parties that she and uh, Alan gave. I got to know her really well, and uh, followed her all the way through after the war. And uh, she, she wrote a very flattering review of my first book, um, What Makes Sammy Run? was interested uh, uh, in the water they fall. And I saw her right to the sort of sad end when she was uh, kind of on her way down at the New Western Hotel. And, and, um, and pretty much, pretty much uh, living on, on handouts from Lillian Hellman. And uh, I, I liked her enormously. I really liked her a lot, although I always thought I don't, I, I want to be the very last person to leave this room at a party because whoever left, no matter how loving and affectionate she was to them, when they walked out the door, she would say something that was so cutting. <laughs> she was a murderous, put her down, or she would just including her own husband, Alan. He would leave the room and she would say something about Alan. Just, oh, God. So I used to think, Jesus, I don't want to leave until the end. But I, in spite of all that, I, I liked her a lot. Tell me about your brother, Stuart Schubert. Stuart was about eight or uh, nine years younger than me. Uh, Stuart was a pretty damn good writer. He wrote a few stories that were in the best stories of the uh, O'Brien short stories. An excellent journalist. And um, uh, he was in the uh, Marine Corps. And uh, I talked to John Ford about him, our, our commander, and, and asked if he could be attached to our uh, OSS unit. And he was. And, uh, Still was really a devoted, hard worker and, and, uh, and very, very smart and great at, at getting along with people. And so Stewart was put in charge at the trial. He was put in charge of the, of the still photographs, which was a, a, a huge job of its own. There were like 12, 12 million stills to go through millions and millions of stills and he uh, he worked with Heinrich uh, Hoffman Hitler's uh, uh, official photographer who was also uh, uh, the uh, the uh, father-in-law of of um, um, Walter von Schirach and even though in, in a way I thought it was really so strange in a way um, Hoffman was really helping to <laughs> Helped me to hang his um, son-in-law. But uh, uh, Stuart also had a wonderful way of uh, working with, with uh, people, he was, with the Germans. I was a little more, I, I was, um, I think, more, in a way more, more anti-German than, I was still not trusting any Germans and th things like that. And, uh, but uh, Stuart had the kind of a nature that would, Make him really very able to to uh, work with with uh, all sorts of people. 
he, and he, um, he really did an outstanding job there. After the war, what happened? What, what did Stuart get involved in? Stuart, after the war, Stuart sort of stayed on in Germany and was put in charge of the, um, of the film division of the Marshall Plan, which was really a, a major, major uh, uh, job over there in, the, in really reconstructing, reconstructing the whole film, German film, film industry. And then, then after that, he made some some independent films in in uh, in uh, in Germany. Some several quite quite well made, quite good uh, feature films. And uh, yeah, then he came back to the States, and eventually, um, well, let's see. Then we you know, then we made made a film. In, together that Stuart produced called um, Wind Across the Everglades, we formed our own little film company. And then after that, he went to work for NBC as a, as, as a film journalist, a very serious one. He was the, the producer of the, um, of the David Brinkley, of the Brinkley uh, Journal, which did some really outstanding work. Um, Stuart was the one who would uh, really uh, uh, find and decide what the subject matter would be, and, and they were really groundbreaking. Uh, David Brinkley was always given a lot of credit, typical of the star system, and that, that it was all David's work, but it, Stuart behind the scene was really the one who, who uh, masterminded that show. He went on then, to become the um, producer for the uh, Today Show. And I think he may have been the longest of all time. It was almost, I think, almost uh, 10 years that he was the producer of the uh, Today Show, and including some very arduous years during the Nixon administration when, when, when any, any time that there was something on the Today Show that, that the White House objected to, her client would call him right away and chew him out, and they want not just equal time, but double equal time. They had, they had a lot of trouble. I remember Stuart telling me one day that her client uh, objected to something because it was anti, I guess, anti Nixon. And to do it, saying, well, this is a, this is a, a journalistic show, we, whatever the news of it, but this pro con we show both, we try to be, show both sides. And, uh, and Klein said to Stuart, well, Mr. Schulberg, I, I, just want you to, I just want you to know that we're watching you. It's, it's, it's sort of scary, you know, sort of big brother at work. Yeah. <clears throat> Of the, of the trial, you mean? Of, no, no, of the, of, the, of the Nazi regime. What are the, what are the visual images that you still keep to this day of everything that you were involved in, in filming, photographing, you know, I, for, for me, one, one of the scariest moments for me in, actually in, in preparing the film for Nuremberg was when we found, thanks to our, Thanks to a Russian 
friends that we made, we found them um, documenting the oppression of, of, the, uh, of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And, and that one particular shot, all these, um, they showed them murdering them, and, and then there's a shot where the German cameraman is down in the pit with a big open pit where they're throwing in these emaciated, naked, emaciated bodies, men, women, mothers with infants in their arms, throwing them in like just like so much garbage. And the, and the German cameraman down below so that it seems as if the bodies are being thrown like that. I'm a, and he's down there photographing this for, for a, a German record. I, I think if, if there's any one uh, uh, horrifying moment, there are so many, but one that comes to mind, somehow it's that, the fact that they could so cold-bloodedly be wanting to recall this instead of wanting to hide it in the deep hole. You had a chance to eyeball every defendant at the Nuremberg trial, especially during the time you showed, the, the film was shown. Yes. Um, any specific reaction you recall of any specific defendant? Um, You've seen something so graphic? They, they um, I, I, I feel you, you could almost see the different uh, uh, defenses on their, on their faces in the, the, uh, the military men. And I think there were four military men really almost turned head, uh, chairs away as if this is nothing to, nothing to uh, do with me. Uh, um, they, some looked, some looked uh, defiant and and uh, and, uh, and uh, angry like uh, a, a striker, and the uh, the uh, diplomats were also rather haughty, as if to as if their body language was saying this is not anything that I I had any part of. They you could see them almost physically separating themselves from what was going on the on the screen. Uh, Gehring, I watched them very close. I was sitting, I got that, I went there very early that morning in the, in the courtroom, and the, the, uh, the um, Russian table was the nearest one to the uh, prisoner's box, and, and I asked them if I could sit right at the very end uh, at that table that morning so I could you be as close as to watching them, so I, I got a very good chance to watch them all. And Gehring, um, um, I you could see his mind sort of spinning. Uh, uh, not, not looking as, as vis visibly upset as uh, Hans Frank. Frank got really, he looked almost physically distressed. And uh, when the lights came on at the end, uh, Hans Frank had really passed out. His head was like down almost on the table. It looked like he was, it, as the others were standing up to, to go back to their cells. Hans Frank who was a gut lighter for Poland and had just seen a film in which the white bring out thousands and thousands. Um, I think he knew he was, it was like he knew he was, he was hanging. He, he was out cold for, and they, and they sort of almost like dragged him out. He was a mess. I know we're probably drawing some closure here, but if, if there's a legacy of Bud Schubert where you had already 90 and many more to come years. Uh, 
What would you want most people to think about Bud Schuber? God, it's hard for me to answer that, Greg, because I never really, it's hard for, I don't think about myself that way, truly. Really. I, I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm so much in what I'm doing, like whether it's covering the next fight or what, I don't really, I, I don't really sit back and wonder what um, people are gonna uh, think about me. I would like to, I, would, I guess if I pause a moment, I would like to think that, uh, I've always felt that a writer has, has a reason. I guess that comes from my early radical days maybe, but I've always felt that a, a writer has a real social responsibility, not just to write about his own personal problems, but to really relate to society and to, and to help in, help to, it sounds pretentious, but sort of help to, to improve it or change it through his work. I've, I've always believed every writer should do that. And um, as I feel, guy was a, a friend of mine also, John Steinbeck, that I, I respected the way John Steinbeck worked and, and related his, his work to the social conditions. I guess that's the sort of thing I would like to think people feel that uh, uh, that, that uh, I tried. That I guess I guess that would be it. You tried and you succeeded. I don't know. Keep trying. I think you're the most amazing guy at age 90, just going forward, not reflecting back. Uh, to be able to get you here, as we talked about last night. It was uh, no easy chore, not because of your condi physical condition, it was you're, you're so active. You're moving, you're in Paris, you're covering fights, and we're just so I, thrilled that you could come to the Jackson Center. I, I do believe in, in uh, keeping busy, and, and, uh, and sometimes I kind of overdo it. I, I, have a ten I have a tendency to, it's not, I, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's an especially good quality to try to do too, damn many things at once, but I do. Just a postscript, uh, what's the status of the potential movie on your s signature book, What Makes Sammy Run? It's, it's, uh... By the way, if it's off the record, you can go tell me. Hmm? What? If it's off the record, we can tell Oh, it. it's off the record? Okay. Oh, 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 okay, fine. Um, so I, I could tell a little on, on the record, but, but it's been on and off, on and off, on and off. In fact, all my life, I mean, I've been talking about it for 50 years, and, and uh, a great deal of enthusiasm. We talked about Mickey Rooney doing it years ago, and Sinatra doing it years ago, and, and, uh, and uh, something always, it builds up and builds up and then stops. Something always stops it. And uh, for quite a year, a few years now, Ben Stiller has been talking about wanting to do it. Over and over again, when he's publicly interviewed, and they ask him what he wants to do next, he'll say, what makes Sammy run? And uh, so, he, he's written a script, uh, a script and uh, it was owned by Warners and DreamWorks, bought it for a huge amount, like two million six. It was a record m amount of money none of which, of course, the writer gets, and, and, um, uh, and then got discovered over there that they had finally decided not to do it. They thought it was too controversial. Too, too controversial. It was almost like this is where I came in with Louis Mayer in, in 1941. And uh, then, just when I thought it was really dead, I said, oh, to hell with it. I'm not even going to worry about it. I'd, I would like to see it made if it could be made well, but I'm not going to think about it. All of a sudden, the phone rings a couple of weeks ago. It's Ben Stiller. It's back on. He wants to do it again. So we had dinner, and he said that they really planned to do it. But uh, I can't. I, it's, it's been on and off so many times that, frankly, I'm, it's like a, it's like a crying wolf. I'm not I'll sort of I think I'll believe it when I go to the opening night. <laughs>
have a similar situation going on with the Joe Lewis. Yes, that's very, that, that's, that's quite similar. Uh, Spike Lee and I about, God, it must be almost four years ago now, talked together about doing a, a film on, uh, on uh, Joe Lewis and, uh, and, uh, and Max uh, Schmeling. And uh, we decided to do it. Uh, one day, a, a truck, literally, a truck drove up, and there were 5,000, uh, like, five by seven cards that Spike had sent me of research for this project. 5,000, literally. They were like this. And uh, so I sat there day by day, making notes and doing this damn thing. And anyway, we both, then we both kind of wrote scripts. And uh, if I kind of got a draft ready. And then two things happened that, uh, that have hurt us a lot. One is that uh, the uh, Ali movie came out, and the movie cost over a million, a uh, hundred million dollars, and uh, and it did not do well at the box office. And uh, and, and the other was that Stars Cable did a Joe Louis Schmeling, that was only I thought only fair, but sort of took some edge edge off the project, and it too it didn't have very good ratings. So, typical Hollywood reaction as well. If Ali, who's much better known for this generation than Joe Lewis, if that doesn't get its money back, maybe Joe Lewis is uh, too big a risk. So we both uh, we put it aside. And then, almost like the Ben Stiller, about three weeks ago, Spike called me. And he said, but I don't think we should give up on this. God damn it, I'm... I'm <laughs> I've, I've, uh, I've, I've read the, a new version, and I'm sending it to you, which I've just read. And, uh, and then we plan, next Wednesday, he's taking a room at the Regency Hotel. He plans to meet at 10 in the morning. He said, let's just stay there page by page, even if it takes us into the night. So that's where I'm going to be next Wednesday. But, uh, and I hope we... Uh, it really ought to be done. It just—it's—it's—it's it's, it's not that we did. It's—it's it's just in its own right a wonderful, amazing story of those two people. You're an amazing story. Thank you very much for all of your time. We look forward to uh, uh, your talk later on. In the meantime, Sandra, and Jean, we're all going to have lunch uh, in the boardroom. So if you want to follow us for next, thank you, Greg. You're the best. <laughs> this is terrible. Um, it's, each, each question is like, like you know, like, like, that's the trouble. I, I get worried that I'll talk too long. I, I could talk for another hour about well, this. we could talk for another About Dorothy Parker. Sandra. Oh, okay. so Sandra. Sandra. My God, Sandra, it's great to see you. What a treat to see you up here. I got here about 10 minutes after you started. Oh, my God. I didn't even know you were here. God, how was your trip? It was, okay. except for getting up at 4.30 yeah. in the morning after an hour's oh sleep. Oh, God. It's fine. It's yeah, that's great. The plane was a little late. They it's amazing to see you. Plane. God, but I'm very glad to see you. Yeah, it was great. It's yeah. really great to see you. Yeah. God. So when are you, going, are you going on to Berlin? I, I, uh, yeah. Tomorrow uh, or today? No, I'm leaving Thursday. When, when are you going? Thursday. Thursday I'm Tuesday. Thursday. Thursday. I, I should say, when are we going? Good. So yeah, I was thinking about going back to the city. Yeah, oh, God. I'm with you guys. I'm flying but, back with you. Oh, great. On the same plane with John, you. Mom, um, Later today. Mom gave me a, mom gave me a little bit of help. Oh, she the, apologized to me. Oh, she did? Yeah. She did? She oh, did. I didn't know that. Yeah, she, I was, she said she, uh, she misunderstood. Oh, oh, oh I'm, God, she didn't tell me that. Oh. I'll be there. Yeah, so we straightened it out. Oh, good. <laughs> Tuesday, Tuesday, I'm feeling very low. I'm still in the hospital. I get this call what? saying, damn you. You made these plans behind my back. Berlin. You're going to Berlin. You're going to Berlin with, with Sandra. You don't even tell me, you know. God. 
She invented this idea. She really, you know. Oh, that's not a thing, yeah. Hmm? She invents a lot of ideas. Yeah. <laughs> I think somebody wants to. Yeah. The only thing is that, mm. the only thing is, it's 11.20. How well, you, if you're gonna, you can have lunch and do the whole thing in, tw in 40 minutes. Where? I mean, if the whole thing, if the next thing starts at 12. Oh, it's impossible. Oh, you, you did an hour interview. Oh, God. You can't, do, you can't start again and do another hour and a half. Oh, no. You have to wait. That's going to have to be. They ask me such hard question. I can't, it's hard to answer. Well, you're going to have to wait half an hour. Yeah. You yeah. just can't. It's just too Can they push it back a little bit? Of a little? Look at that. Anyway. Mr. Schulberg, I'm with a radio station, a local radio station. Mm -hmm. um, my name's Hugh Williams.